Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. A year after winning the White House with the most votes in history, has Joe Biden fizzled out? Let's get to the bottom line. The Democratic Party and President Joe Biden got a major reality check last week after local elections across the country. The Democrats lost several key races, particularly the governor's mansion in Virginia, indicating an end to the blue wave, if there ever really was one, after last year's presidential vote. Biden got a key part of his agenda, a massive spending package to fix America's infrastructure passed at the end of the week, but it was too late to help his party in the elections. That popular bipartisan infrastructure bill? Well, it was held hostage by the far left of his own Democratic Party. Now the second part of his agenda, or should we say his legacy, the one that includes his big plans for society and the environment called Build Back Better, remains stuck in Congress, a victim of Democratic inviting between progressives and conservatives. When Republicans flipped the state of Virginia, they gave a hint of what could happen in next year's midterm election, when the entire House of Representatives and one-third of the United States Senate are up for grabs. The recipe seems to be keep Donald Trump close, but not too close, and attack the progressives. Meanwhile, the job approval ratings of Biden are really sinking, and some polls show that more Americans want to see the Donald run in the next election rather than Joe Biden. So can the Democrats build Biden back better and fast? Today we're talking to Tara Palmieri, who writes the Politico Playbook, a prominent political newsletter here in Washington, D.C., and David Vondrell, a columnist on national politics for The Washington Post. Thanks to both of you for joining me. Let me read something that, that President Biden said on October 28th, just before the November 2nd election. He says, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that the House and Senate majorities and my presidency will be determined by what happens in the next week. Well, David, what did happen in the election uh, that, that has happened recently? What is that uh, uh, decision that's been delivered to Joe Biden that he said was so consequential? Well, that was an amazing statement that he made without uh, having counted the votes. Uh, I was stunned that somebody who had been in politics as long as Joe Biden has would go out and stake his flag there without knowing that he had the votes, and he didn't. Uh, the... Uh, the progressive wing of his party, again, knocked down uh, the idea of giving him the vote that he wanted uh, before he set off for his trip to Europe. And uh, as a result, I think uh, he only added to the impression that is growing that uh, he is not in control of uh, his party or his administration. At a time when people are, are feeling, Americans are feeling increasingly uh, un, uncomfortable, uncertain, alarmed about uh, the direction of the government. Well, thank you. Well, Tara, uh, I want to focus a little bit on the Virginia race for a moment, where Terry McAuliffe mm -hmm. was running against a Republican challenger, Glenn Youngkin. The Democrats held Virginia. But Terry McAuliffe is mm -hmm. just not every everyday politician. He was Bill Clinton's best friend. He was the sort of chief operator, uh, in a way, the biggest fundraiser uh, in, in the, you know, in the Democratic Party for years. And he is a guy who had been governor before, who really did right. lead on Virginia infrastructure. And Terry McAuliffe lost by 10 points. And, and then the right. last election, the Democrats won by 10 points. So that's a 20-point spread. What happened in Virginia from your, your viewpoint? I don't think Terry McAuliffe had a lot of messaging. That was part of the problem. He focused so much on pinning his opponent to Donald Trump and turning Virginia into a referendum on Donald Trump when, frankly, people are saying, Donald Trump, when I go to the gas station and I have to pay, you know, $10 more to fill up my tank, I'm not thinking about Donald Trump. I'm thinking about the fact that the White House, the Senate, and the House are controlled by Democrats. So ultimately, that is the party in power. The party in power was not was not popular in Virginia. Terry McCall said it himself. He said Washington headwinds are coming our way. The president is not popular. And so, therefore, he became a victim of the Democratic Party and the dysfunction in Washington, which, as we know, isn't that far from Virginia, right? Um, and suddenly, it started to look like, hey, Democrats can't govern. They can't make things happen. And Terry suffered for it. And the, the worst part about it is he didn't have anything to say. He didn't have any he didn't have a victory to show from the Democratic Party. He didn't really have a vision either. And Glenn Youngkin, frankly, was a strong candidate for the Republicans. He really was. Um, 
So they were lucky in that sense. He seized on education, which after, you know, years of school closing due to COVID, a lot of parents frustrated feeling like they're not being heard. He was able to work on those sort of like pocketbook issues and just day-to-day -day local and state issues that people really need, especially now that they're not feeling much trust from the broader government. David, one of, thank you for talking. One of the things that I found interesting is that, that Joe Biden and Barack Obama uh, went to Virginia and campaigned for Terry McAuliffe. Uh, Donald Trump did not go there. What is the deeper message of what you see in the shift that we saw, not only in Virginia, but elsewhere around the country? You wrote about it recently in The Washington Post. Well, I think what we've seen, Steve, is an amazing, uh, uh, you know, I call it a manic episode uh, in the Democratic Party that uh, because they were able to get 50 votes in the Senate, the, the tiniest conceivable uh, majority, it's only a majority because the vice president can pass, uh, cast uh, deciding votes in the case of a tie. So this razor-thin margin in the Senate, a very small margin in the House, somehow they came into Washington and started talking about Joe Biden as if he was going to be uh, Lyndon Johnson in 1965 or Franklin Roosevelt in 1935, uh, presidents who had overwhelming majorities in the Congress when they passed uh, the New Deal and the Great Society. Uh, it seems to me, again, I talk about the mystery of, of, of Biden. It's as if he was uh, entranced or under a spell to think that he could pass uh, uh, great society-sized legislation with uh, microscopic majorities. It just doesn't happen that way. And so, as a result, we've seen uh, the progressive uh, end of his party uh, talking about originally six plus trillion dollars of social spending. Th then Biden made it three and a half trillion. Those numbers were never going to happen. And uh, and and uh, so we've had this uh, long period of wheel spinning and uh, you know a circular firing squad inside the Democratic Party that uh, has you know contributed to this idea that uh, Joe Biden uh, can't deliver uh, on his promises. Had he simply said from the start, look, uh, we've got a 50-50 government, and, uh, and I'm going to try to do a, a few things that uh, are popular with both parties. You know, I think he could have gotten his COVID relief bill. I think he could have gotten this bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, and he might have been able to get some social spending, too. But uh, it, it, it's the messaging as much as the uh, actual uh, legislating. He set himself up to make it look as if uh, three-plus trillion dollars worth of spending is a failure. Um, and uh, that, to me, is political malpractice. Well, thanks, Tara. Yeah, but he needed to temper. Yeah, I was gonna say he needed to temper expectations from the beginning, mm. and they never did that. Instead, they uh, bear hugged. But why the didn't he? I mean, I mean, Tara. I mean, Joe Biden beat Bernie Sanders in the primary uh, to run for president. He beat Elizabeth Warren. He beat back the progressives with the message that he was with every man. He was going to be common Joe, you know, with the truckers and the folks from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, and, and so yeah. I, what I'm interested in is where that came off. And, and you know, it really asked the kind of big question for our audience. You know, the conservative Democrat gets talked a lot about is Senator Joe Manchin. The ones on the left and the Democrat. I mean, it's been a lot more fun to look at the battle within the Democrats than it is between Democrats right. and Republicans. So did Joe Manchin win this election? Did Bernie and do Bernie Banders AOC and our Elizabeth Warren out now? I think it was a miscalculation because ultimately Biden won the presidency because people wanted a safe pair of hands that wasn't Donald Trump. And he really won independence, right? He won women in the suburbs who may have voted for Donald Trump in the last election. And I think instead of being to those voters and what they wanted this whole time, he let the progressive party take over and, and sort of run the roost. He basically let the kids, you know, take over the house and party and the parents who ultimately voted for him they, you know, they said enough's enough. Like we need to, this isn't working. Um, and 
did Bernie Sanders win? No, he lost in this case. Joe Manchin won. Ultimately, that bill can die in the Senate, the, the, uh, build, back that, um, the build Back Better bill. It's up to him. He can decide what he wants to do. Um, he can put what he wants in it. Um, and no, I don't think Bernie Sanders won in this case. And I think the idea of hijacking one bill for another, it may have been a lesson to Democrats that, you know, this doesn't really work. You know, as you look forward, there are elements uh, in that Build Back Better bill, like um, uh, support for uh, child care and a kind of broadened set of A lot of these things have been gutted out of it now that we're taking seniors, you know, and expanding what whole health meant uh, in Medicare for dental care and things, you know, that if you look at, say, really makes sense when you look at it, but the price tag was so high. Uh, Joe Manchin again said he wasn't going to support paid leave, which was from many of my progressive friends called me and said, you know, that's a real gut punch to women in this country. Why is Joe Manchin not on board with that? And his line is, you know, we can't right now afford the entitlements we have until we get those under control. It's dangerous to add more entitlements. I guess my point to ask you right now is where's the equilibrium in the country? Because there are big questions about growing inequality, about people being left behind, and about, you know, a, a society that tilts more towards New York and finance than it does towards Main Street. How do you, what, I'd be interested in, you know, your sense of those dynamics. I think that's very real, and I hear it from, uh, from friends of mine who are wealthy as well as from friends of mine who are living paycheck to paycheck. I think there's a real concern about uh, structure of uh, wealth and more, more than wealth opportunity in the United States. Uh, I don't think that that necessarily is in the, uh, the larger version of the Build Back Better because, as uh, Senator Manchin pointed out, uh, none of those programs are means tested. Uh, they were talking about forgiving college debts of, of, of wealthy kids and wealthy people as well as poor people. They're talking about, uh, you know, same with paid leave, same with uh, all of these entitlements. Uh, there was originally no means testing at all so that, uh, you know, uh, wealthy people would be getting government relief as well as poor people. Meanwhile, there's the actual in-the-pocketbook uh, effect of, as you talked about earlier, gasoline prices, uh, or, or Tara did, gasoline prices have jumped up, food prices are going up, people are getting hit in the pocketbook now, and that makes it harder for them to talk about uh, unlimited spending into the future. So. I think the balance of power now is not only with Joe Manchin, but with the six or eight or 10 or 12 Democratic senators who have been silently cheering him on all along because they come from states that can be put into play by this uh, same sort of uh, uh, swing in the vote that happened in uh, Virginia last week and in uh, New Jersey last week. Uh, so the idea that it's just been lonely Joe Manchin all along uh, <laughs> is not quite right. He's had a lot of support from senators and from House members who have been quietly rooting for him all along. Uh, thank you. Tara, um, Ron Klain, White House chief of staff, was out there recently saying it's been a rough and tough year. But that said, he said, you know, when they inherited a high debt economy, you know, a, a, an economy creating 50,000 jobs a month and 4,000 people a day dying from COVID, and then now they're producing 500,000 jobs a month, the COVID numbers have drawn down. But, mm -hmm. but this doesn't seem to be playing to their advantage, because when you look at Joe Biden's approval ratings, they've fallen to 37.8 percent, and the disapproval right. ratings are 59 percent staggering. Those are Trump numbers. So, so Joe Biden, in terms of popularity and disapproval, is where uh, the guy was that he beat. I, you know, what, what's your take on why they've gotten this so wrong? Well, I think in the terms of the jobs numbers as well, even though they are impressive, there's still a lot of people on the other side who are trying to hire and they can't get um, they can't hire enough people. Like, there's actually an employment shortage, and the jobs numbers are low. So it's this weird dichotomy. Um, they don't have a lot of... They didn't have much to talk about for a while because they had any major bills. And even the COVID legislation that they passed earlier on, the, um, I guess you could call it like a stimulus, 
it was a check. It was a nice check. $1,400 is great, right? But it doesn't last for that long. And I don't think that one check is going to change the way people feel about how they manage the pandemic or change the way people feel about the fact that they just feel like they're, you know, I mean, when inflation is a problem, when inflation is becoming a problem and major experts, not just Republican economists, but Democratic economists, Larry Summers are saying this is a real problem. People aren't dumb. They know that if you don't have a lot of money, you can't spend money, right? So there's just this kind of that feeling, I think, on Main Street, uh, like David said, that something doesn't feel right. And because it, it is, it was a, a burden to honestly, to, to, to have the power in the House, the Senate and the White House for Joe Biden, because he really never had it. And people just, just, just aren't going to take the time to think about the fact that, wait, you won the Senate, it's actually tied. You have this thing called reconciliation. I don't think people daily are thinking about how there could be a party vote on some issues and not on the others. And I think ultimately they're just saying Democrats control, they control Washington, and this is how I feel at home on Main Street, and they're suffering for it because they really didn't message it properly. Right. They weren't supposed to win the Senate, you know, yeah. and, and they sh Biden should have tempered expectations. As we look at 2022, and you know, where you, you know, now the now the races are starting for the next elections, and it's not looking good. I talked to somebody who was at one, the, the very high level up in a Democratic Party in a southern state and said, if Democrats aren't scared to death by what just happened in Virginia and don't pivot, they're going to be in huge trouble uh, in the midterm elections. And I guess my question is, might that not be good for Joe Biden? Might it be OK to wash away that 50-50 uh, and get into a losing hand uh, with the senator of the House and then be able to you know, justify negotiating in the middle? David? Uh, it might be. I think he's going to get to have that experience. Um, <laughs> just uh, Whether he wants it or uh, not. <laughs> midterm elections, first term midterms are generally bad for presidents. Uh, and I don't see any reason to think that won't be the case uh, for uh, Biden as well. Uh, but it's never too late or too early for presidents to, uh, you know, to pivot and uh, change their their messaging. And, uh, you know, my advice, for what it's worth, is, is twofold. One, it's all about the pandemic. I, I wrote this when Biden was elected, again, when he was inaugurated. He, the public will judge him based on whether our lives get back to normal. And uh, yes, he's had some headwinds with the anti-vaccine uh, nonsense and, and uh, so on, but we haven't seen him out there every single day messaging, leading with the fact that he is working on the pandemic. That's, people want their kids out of masks, they want them in school, they want them playing together, having play dates. They, they want the world back to normal. They need to know that he's that that's his job one. And related to that, you know, claiming victories, small victories. This is the lesson from Clinton in the late '90s. Uh, you know, it doesn't always have to be a two trillion dollar bill. It can be safer car seats. Right. It can be uh, you know. Uh, opening up the uh, strategic reserve to try to bring down gas prices a little bit. Hmm. Small wins can resonate as big as big wins. Tara, where did this inflection point in the sense of Joe Biden's competency begin to shift? Was it was it was it oil and gas? Was it something small? Was it Afghanistan and the withdrawal from Afghanistan? What's your sense? I think it was the withdrawal from Afghanistan when he really lost a lot of confidence and his numbers just tanked. Um, I also think that a lot of people just feel like there was a hundred down and what happened, and it was such a mess, and not a lot of apologies either, right, or, or ownership of the fact that it didn't work and right. it, it didn't go well. And I think, again, a big part of the reason that Joe Biden won the presidency was kind of less about him and more about Trump, right? Right. Because well, that was a, a Trump thing to do, just to pull out and to let the chaos ensue. Yeah. People just wanted an adult. And that was not right. 
what people thought they voted for. Well, David, you know, we haven't hardly talked about Donald Trump, which in many ways is refreshing, but we need to talk about Donald uh, Trump because, you know, he is, he is uh, you know, he's lurking out there in a way. But where is Trump's ghost in all of this? And does he matter anymore in your, in your playbook? I think he matters less and less with uh, each passing day. Hmm. Uh, the fact that uh, the governor of Virginia uh, was, uh, you know, delivered... You know, it, it, Youngkin way outperformed uh, Trump in Trump country of Virginia and of, uh, of, of New Jersey as well. Um, so he's he was able to drive, uh, you know, more votes, more turnout, uh, while keeping uh, the former president sort of at arm's length mm. uh, than uh, Donald Trump could do for himself. Um, I think uh, there's we've reelected a former president one time in the history of the country. So uh, I, I think it's a long shot to bet on uh, you know the, the 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 tendency is to look forward and right. to uh, you know come up with the next person. Um, right. Very dangerous for former President Trump's, Political future that uh, candidate was able to do as well as Youngkin did right. uh, without uh, kissing up to him. So it sounds like there's promise, in, 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 at least in some level, in the Republican Party. Charlie, let me give you a last minute here. Uh, Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris, practically invisible. Joe Biden's numbers are in the tank. W should they bring her into a, a, a more visible position? Give us your short take. The times when she has been in visible positions, like that interview on the border, you know, saying, I saw Europe when asked why she hadn't actually visited the border. I mean, she's been put out there. She's been given a few a few times to stand, to, to be the public face of the administration, and she sort of failed. And I think they took a lot away from her because of that. She's not the face of the infrastructure bill, which is popular. Build back better. She really didn't do much to promote it either. They haven't given her anything economic. In fact, they keep giving her losing issues like voting rights, the border, the kind of things that she can't really do a lot about. But when out there, they find she's not reliable public face. And her poll numbers, according to this recent Monmouth Suffolk poll, are even lower than Joe Biden, 28 percent. Wow, that's that so is that is. I just a, don't that see, is, think that they don't see her as an effective messenger. Right, that is that is huge. When we come back a year, and I have you both on this show a year from now, uh, who will own the House of Representatives? <laughs> I think the obvious thing is that it will be Republicans who run the House of Representatives. I think the Senate is a toss-up, uh, just based on the fact that the Republicans haven't recruited a lot of popular, uh, a lot of strong candidates at this point. But if they had, they'd probably be able to take the Senate as well. But they have these issues with. People that, frankly, Trump endorsed too soon. Well, there you have it. So Tara Palmieri, Politico, <laughs> and David Vondrell of The Washington Post, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So what's the bottom line? It's true that President Joe Biden got the most votes of any president in U.S. history. But does that mean he got a mandate to pass any laws that he wants? Not at all. What's also ironic is that the centrist leading Biden beat Bernie Sanders and he beat Elizabeth Warren, the leftist stalwarts of the Democratic Party, in the race to the White House. But then he allowed himself to get stuck with the left's political agenda. What's clear is that the nation wants some progressive change, but they don't want too much. The other big lesson learned is that former President Donald Trump doesn't seem to figure significantly in swinging voters right or left. That's not only a good thing for Democrats, but it's probably a good thing for Republicans, too. And that's the bottom line.